avoidance experts. Dr. Gleb is an internationally renowned thought leader, thought leader, I really can't talk today, sorry, <laughs> he's a thought leader, in future proofing. He helps small business owners forecast and address threats and maximize opportunities as the CEO of the Future Proofing Consultancy Disaster Avoidance Experts. A best-selling author of several traditionally published books, Dr. Gleb is most well known for his 2019 bestseller, Never Go With Your Gut, How Pioneering Leaders Make the Best Decisions and Avoid Business Disasters. His groundbreaking thought leadership was featured in over 550 articles and 450 interviews in prominent venues, including Fortune, Magazine, Fast Company, and many more. Dr. Gleb's experience comes from over 20 years of consulting, coaching, and training for small businesses, and from his research background as a behavioral scientist with 15 years in academia. To help you take advantage of his groundbreaking expertise, I've asked him to share with us how effective leaders make the most profitable decisions by neuroscience. Thank you so much, Dr. Stapersky. Take it away for us. Thank you for that very kind introduction. So really appreciate it. And no worries, it is early in the morning and can be harder to speak when we're not fully awake, don't have a lot of coffee that we need. All right, everyone. So let's take talk about how you as leaders of small businesses, whether solopreneurs or smaller businesses or large small businesses of all sizes can make the most profitable decisions using the latest research from neuroscience. So that's what I'll be talking about. That's where my background is. We tend to make bad decisions as many people do because we don't realize how our feelings, intuitions, emotions, mental processes are causing us to put, make bad decisions. That's why you've probably heard the research that about half of all small businesses fail within the first five years and three quarters fail within the first 15 years. And of course, many fail afterwards. So you don't wanna be in that three quarters, 75% that fail within the first 15 years. So how do you prevent that? How do you take the steps that you need to not fail and to make the most profitable decisions to survive and thrive in the post COVID recovery and more broadly? So that's what we'll be talking about today. I want to start by talking about something that you've probably heard many people advise you to be, be confident. Be confident, confidence is an important key of decision-making for you as leaders. How do you make decisions where you feel confident that you're making the right decisions? And you need to have some confidence in your decisions, right? To go forward, inspire others, and just do the things that you need to do in order to implement the decisions, and make some profit. Now, confidence comes in many areas of life, including not simply, of course, leading, but driving. You need to be confident on the road when you're going around cars and highways and so on. So I want to ask you, well, with a poll, I want to ask you to take a poll and respond. You'll be able to see a poll uh, right now and tell me how good are your driving skills, above average or below average? Would you say you're in the top half of all drivers or in the bottom half of all drivers? So please go ahead and take that poll. Are you in the top half of all drivers or in the bottom half of all drivers? Are you below average, so in the bottom half or above average in the top half? Let's see, I see 85% of you voted. I'll give a couple more seconds for those who didn't make their voice heard yet. All right, so let's take a look. Well, we see that three quarters of you are above average drivers. <laughs> three quarters of you are above average drivers. Now, it's not that likely that three quarters of you are above average drivers because you know, about half of you should be in the top half and half of you should be in the bottom half. <laughs> And that is a typical result we see when we look at our confidence levels. We tend to be overconfident, whether in our driving abilities or in our business decision-making abilities. So that is a problem when people tell us to be confident. It causes too much confidence because that's we get too much of the message that we should be too con that we should be confident in our decision making. Especially small business owners like yourselves get a lot of this. And by the way, I'm a small business owner myself. I run a six people company called Disaster Avoidance Experts. It's a coaching, consulting, and training firm. So 
I understand that it's tempting to be confident about my decision-making abilities. I learned this stuff. I learned that I should not be confident, but it's very tempting to do so because that helps me feel good about my decision-making. But feeling good about your decision-making and your decisions being right are two different things. We all suffer from what's called the overconfidence bias. Now, on average, all of us tend to be somewhat overconfident. Not every one of us, not every single one of us, but on average, we tend to be overconfident about our decisions. And that is, extend, I'll send you some resources after the presentation so you can see the citations that peer-reviewed research done on business leaders and others on their overconfidence. But one interesting factum is that there's a study showing that when people say they're 100% confident, so they bet the company, on this decision. They're only right 80% of the time, 80% of the time. That means that one, that one of those times out of five bets, you would lose that bet. And if you make those bets once a year, that's how you have a situation where half of all star, star startups fail within the first five years, right? So it's not a good idea to feel that much confidence, but that's what we feel. When we feel we're 100% confident, that's how it feels inside we make a mistake about 20% of the time. So that's pretty serious. You know, no wonder that Las Vegas gets so much money. So this is especially dangerous for those with more experience in authority. Those with more experience in authority. There was an interesting study done on doctors, which compared doctors who are senior in terms of experience, lots and lots of experience, and junior doctors who were just fresh out of medical school. And they were given a case to diagnose, hey, what's going on with this patient? So the, both of them looked at the same case and they gave the diagnosis. And they were right at about the same rate, both the ones who had extensive experience, the senior doctors, and the ones who were just out of medical school, the junior doctors. But the senior doctors were way, way more confident about the accuracy of their decisions. And you know, you might be surprised about this, you know, senior, why would senior doctors not be more right? I mean, they have experience and know-how. Well, junior doctors, actually just finished their medical degrees. So they have more knowledge, more recent knowledge, more recent updated information. And so they were right at the same amount of time, at the same percentage about the diagnosing the case. And that applies to business leaders. You know, when you're in this business, you feel a lot of experience, you have a lot of experience, you have a lot of authority. And so you've been in the business for a while, but you don't notice when the conditions are changing, when things are shifting. So you're using your old, routines and your, your old uh, habits of making decisions and those kind of you know, mental processes that you have around making decisions and applying them to new situations where they don't apply very well. And that is one of the ways that overconfidence bias causes us to make bad mistakes. That's something to watch out for, overconfidence bias. This is more broadly a problem that really you need to be aware of. You have a lot of gurus who tell you to go with your gut. You know, Tony Robbins tells us to be primal, be savage. Malcolm Gladwell tells us to blink, make our decisions in the blink of an eye in his book, Blink. They tell you to go with your gut, trust your heart, follow your intuition. That's the advice you get. And it feels very comfortable. Of course it does. Our gut is, feels comfortable. That's our intuition. That's our gut reactions. It feels very comfortable to trust our gut. That's how we are evolved. We are evolved to trust our gut. So think about our evolutionary background. It's not something that's a fit for the modern world. Trusting our gut in the modern world often leads to disasters. That's why so many people fail to predict the COVID-19 pandemic or how long it lasted. I have a lot of, I published a number of articles early on in the pandemic about this will be much longer than we think and much worse than we think. And you know, people did not take those seriously. And I, I can send you resources about that. They're published in Business Insider, Inc. Magazine, and so on. So some of the publications that Sue mentioned. But people didn't trust that. And well, that, that was a big problem that they didn't trust that information. So you need to think and realize that your own intuitions are often going to lead you in the wrong direction because they're not evolved for the modern world. We are evolved for the ancient savannah. When we lived in small tribes of 15 people to 150 people, when we were hunters, gatherers, and foragers, we had to have that immediate fight or flight reflex. And that fight or flight reflex is still our main decision-making impulse in the modern world. When we have a decision, we are very much tempted to make a snap judgment, whether it's a minor decision 
or a very huge major decision. Now, when we feel some way about the pandemic, we will tend to make a decision about the pandemic based on how we feel, regardless of the fact that we've never been in a pandemic situation before that was nearly as major, nearly as big, nearly as impactful. When we are in the 2008-2009 fiscal crisis, we are tempted to make decisions based on our previous knowledge, and that's not applicable in that situation. When we're dealing with things like smartphones, we're tempted to make decisions based on what we knew before, but you know, smartphones have really changed our lives. So there's so many changes in our lives and in your individual industry, you know, in the insurance industry that we're talking about, there's a lot of shifts in the insurance industry with having to do with algorithms like root insurance that has been making predictions and changes, not based on the traditional kind of evaluations, but based on algorithmic evaluations of how people behave. Those are things that are disruptive and we are not well prepared for disruptions. So this is something that we need to be really watching out for. This is a problem. And there is a specific series of these dangerous judgment errors that we make. Dangerous judgment errors called cognitive biases. The overconfidence bias is one of these cognitive biases. So if you look up the literature in cognitive biases, you can look it up on Wikipedia. There's a list of over 100 cognitive biases and the peer reviewed literature and business leaders and the business schools, ordinary people, all sorts of folks on um, how they fall into these dangerous judgment errors that come from how our brain is wired. They come from this evolutionary background where we still have the impulses, we still make decisions that are based on the impulses that come from the savanna environment and not things that are informed by the modern world. I mean, the modern world with the internet has really been around since the 1990s. We haven't evolved for it. Our intuitions, our gut reactions, those things that the gurus tell you to follow are about the savannah environment, and that's not helpful. And then just the structure of our brain, the wiring of our brain, which I won't go in depth into right now because we don't have too much time, and I'm happy to answer questions about this. Now, let's go to another poll. I'm curious if any of you had the experience of falling into a cognitive bias, and here I'll talk about decisions. So think about a decision. Did you ever have the following happen to you? You made a bad decision, but looking back, you realize you had the information you needed to make a better decision. I mean, I know it happened to me when I was promoting someone to an assistant manager role from the ranks. I thought that she would be a great assistant manager. She was in the company for a while. She did well as a rank and file employee. But then when I promoted her, she was really not capable of letting go of her previous attitudes and attachments. And she was really micromanaging people because she wanted them to do the things that she, the way that the things, the way that she was doing them. So that was, did not work out well. And I had to let her go. And that was a mistake I made. Well, I see that about two thirds of you voted. So let's give you five more seconds to vote. If you ever had the following happen to you. All right, so we see that overwhelmingly that's something that happened to you, that pretty much all, almost everyone had that happen to you over 96% of you. So that's a very common experience. And that is the example of you falling into one of many dangerous judgment errors. There are over a hundred of them. And the list in Wikipedia has all the information of them. Oh, well, it says, William says it's her first wife. Fair enough. Yes, we fall into it in our relationships all the time. Yep. Definitely. Relationships as well as business decisions. So this is something that happens very often. So that's something we need to be aware of, that that is a major, major issue. All right. And so I want to chat a little bit about how we can address these dangerous judgment errors. Now, there are many techniques, and I'll send you more resources after the presentation on a variety of techniques to deal with them, because you know you need to be aware of them. That's the first step. And you know, now you're aware of the cognitive bias called overconfidence bias. There are over 100 others, and you need to learn about the most dangerous ones for business settings, which there are 30. And that's outlined in the resources I'll email you after the presentation. But you also want to know, not simply be aware of them, but how do you take steps to address them? There's a very quick and effective decision-making technique that only takes a couple of minutes once you know about it, once you learn about it, once you practice it, only takes a couple of minutes for any decision you don't wanna screw up. This is for small business leaders like myself and like you, the large majority of our decisions are going to be good enough decisions. So you want a decision-making technique that prevents you from screwing up. Now, there are gonna be some decisions that you want the perfect decision. You want as much resources 
from this, you know, deciding on your next major product. That's you want to make it as perfect as possible. So this is not good enough for that. But the large majority of decisions you're making, you just want to make a good enough decision. And to do that, you need to answer five questions about any decision that you don't want to turn into a disaster. So this is called the five questions to avoid five question to avoid decision disasters. First question. What important information didn't I yet fully consider? So what evidence didn't you take into account? Now, there are two components to this question. One is fully consider. Now, we tend to not fully consider information that goes against our intuition, that goes against our preferences. So you need to look at information twice as hard that goes against your preferences, that goes against your intuitions. You know, maybe you already have an intuition towards selecting a certain vendor. And then you want to really vet that vendor extra hard. You try to disprove the idea that you should select this vendor and say, maybe I should select another vendor. So if you can't prove yourself wrong, that's great. But if you can prove yourself wrong, that's even better because then it'll prevent you from making a bad decision. And again, the same thing of making a new hire, launching a new product or something like that. Then important information. You don't want to fall into analysis paralysis and consider information that is not so important for making the decision. So of course, the more important, they should be using this technique, by the way, two to five times a day. So when you're make, writing an important email to a client trying to persuade them to do something or writing an email to a you know, government regulatory agency, checking in on your PPP or something like that, this is definitely a technique you should be using. So think about what, what information is important. You don't want to go down the rabbit hole, look for information that's not important, really look for information that is important and decide in advance what information is important. Next, what dangerous judgment errors didn't I yet address? The overconfidence bias might be one of them. There are a number of others. Like I said, I'll send you resources on these and so that you learn about these dangerous judgment errors that you need to address. Next, what would a trusted and objective advisor suggest I do? So think about that angel on your shoulder. What would that person suggest you do in the situation? We get about 50% of the benefit of this question just by stepping outside of ourselves. So thinking about, hey, what would I tell a, trust, a friend to do in this situation? If I was outside of myself, this was not me. What would I tell that friend? And the other, you get the other 50% of the benefit by calling this person or you know, if you're a millennial, texting this person. And again, there are many people who you can turn to. You can turn to people in the Chamber of Commerce, of course, maybe on the advisory board or various other boards of the Chamber of Commerce. You can turn to a coach, a consultant, or somebody like that. So you can turn to a peer, to a mentor. So folks like that, those are people who would be trusted and objective advisors. Next, how have I addressed all the ways this could fail? So think about the project, the decision. Let's say you're hiring a new employee. How have you addressed the ways that hiring this new employee could fail. Maybe the employee would not work out because they weren't sufficiently acculturated to the firm and the way the company, the way it runs. Maybe you want to take more time than you anticipate necessary at the beginning to get them into the habits of the ways that we do things around here because it's, not, it's intuitive to you that this is the way that things are done around here, but a new employee wouldn't know that. So really making a point of documenting your systems, documenting your processes, and documenting your culture and conveying that to the new employee as a strategy to help that employee not fail. Finally, what new information would cause me to revisit this decision? What would cause you to change your mind about this choice? So for example, we talked about a new vendor. So let's say you selected the new vendor. What would cause you to change your mind about this new vendor? You know, would, let's say their service is not as good as advertised or their product is lower quality. You want to set a specific point, specific series of points for saying, okay, this would cause me to revisit this decision, change my mind about this vendor. So that is something that you want to decide in advance because if you don't decide that in advance, it'll be very tempting to stick to our initial decision. It's called, called post-factum rationalization. We rationalize our decisions after we make them, we tend to get stuck to them and because we're emotionally invested, we care about our decisions, we care about ourselves, we don't like to think that we are wrong. But if we decide in advance that, hey, this is the information that would cause me to revisit this decision, that's a much more effective approach to addressing this problem. All right, now let's talk about this technique. I'm curious, how many of you think it would be helpful 
for your bottom line, for you and your team, if you're not a solopreneur, if you're a solopreneur, it just applies to you, to use the five questions for any decision you don't want to get wrong, for any decision you don't want to screw up. Would it help you? Please go ahead and vote. See about, we have about half of you voting, just over half. Okay, I'll give you five more seconds for the rest of you who hasn't, haven't voted yet, five more seconds. Great, so this seems to be a very popular technique that's excellent. So the vast majority of you would want to use it, you know, the same amount of you who, you know, 96%, the same amount of you who had a decision that you got wrong in the past, I mean, probably the 1% of the, the 4% are the ones who never had a decision they got wrong in the past and they didn't regret it. All right, great. So I'm glad to hear it and I'll send you more information about this technique. And the final thing, I promise to send you information. So here are the resources that you'll get, the free additional resources. There will be an assessment on dangerous judgment errors in the workplace that describes the 30 most dangerous judgment errors so that you assess them in yourself, your team. If you're a solopreneur, just what you're doing. If you are a small business owner, then the, your whole team. Then the decision aid on five key questions to avoid decision disasters. So I'll happily send that to you. Then sample chapters from my bestseller. Never go with your gut, how pioneering leaders make the best decisions and avoid business disasters. And finally, a coaching session with three open slots. It's gonna be first come, first serve. I'll send you a link with the coaching session. If it's the first three people who click on that link and schedule a coaching slot, will get that. If you don't have, if you click on it and you don't have a coaching slot to schedule, that means it's all taken. So those are the resources. And the same way with the poll, how many of you would like the resources? Please go ahead and vote. And in the meantime, I'll be happy to take any questions you have about this topic. For any of you who would like to um, ask a question, post it in the chat and uh, we'll be happy to answer any questions or queries that you have, or even some areas where you perhaps might want uh, Dr. Gleb to just go maybe a little deeper and um, give some context, particularly if you're thinking about your business and how some of these things might apply specifically for you. And I'll do, we'll just give you a moment to put any questions in and um, I don't want to move on too soon in case. Um, well, while any of you are talking, I would like to actually ask Kristen Away Barry. But before I do, I'd just like to say a huge thank you to Dr. Sapersky for your presentation today. And thank you for these pills of wisdom to help us um, stay out of trouble and actually make the best decisions possible in our business. Because it's the quality of our decisions that really govern the success of our business. Now I do see some um, actual comments coming, coming in. So I'm sorry, Kirsten, <laughs> hold on one second. So we have um, Bill Sheffer says, you mentioned and paralysis by analysis. What's the tipping point between that and getting the info needed to make a good decision? What you want to decide in advance is how much information you need, and that should depend on the importance of the decision. So you want to set a limit on the amount of time and effort you take to gather information. That is the best approach to deciding the tipping point. Well, of course, every decision will be different. If you're making a decision on, let's say, moving your office, you'll want to gather quite a bit more research on that than a decision on you know, a minor vendor, you know, getting some, a new computer desk or something like that. So that is the process. It's a process technique. You, it's, you're basically making a decision in advance on how much information you need and what kind of information based on the importance and significance for the bottom line of each decision that you're taking. Thank you for that. Now, Jonathan Bergman says, this can take a long time to research. So are there times that it's okay to go with your gut? The five questions technique takes about two minutes once you have some practice with it. 
you know, you ask yourself, what important information did I yet fully consider? Dangerous judgment errors. What would somebody who was a trusted objective advisor suggest I do? Though, how have I addressed all the ways this could fail? And what important information, what information would cause me to revisit this decision? That is a very quick technique. So it really does not make sense to go with your gut until you may, while you haven't asked those questions. The thing is, it's very tempting to go with your gut. And I understand where you're coming from, Jonathan. The snap judgment that is within us from the evolutionary background, the fight or flight response causes us to feel like we should go with our gut in times when we really don't need to. You know, there's pretty much never, almost never, a business decision where you need to make an immediate decision. If you feel pressured by someone who's with you on saying, okay, you need to make this decision now, then they're probably telling you something that is, you know, that they might not be the most trustworthy business partner to have if they're not giving you, you know, five minutes to think about a decision and make take a next step. You know, you might not want to trust that person and make the decision right then because they're pressuring you. It's a pressure technique. It's, it's not a good technique for a long-term collaborative effective business relationship. So I would challenge that. There's really no time to simply go with your gut because your gut will steer you in the wrong direction often. Now, your gut might be right or it might be wrong, but you should always check with your head before you go with your gut. Because again, our gut will sometimes steer us in the wrong direction. So those five questions help you check your gut and make sure that it's not steering you in the wrong direction. Again, that's, it helps you make sure that you make a good enough decision. It's not the perfect decision, but it's a good enough decision. And that's what you wanna make sure that your gut is not getting you in the direction of the you know, half of all startups that fail within the first five years. And I think that uh, your comprehensive answer has probably answered a few of these other questions here. So um, I apologize, I'm not skipping over folks, but we obviously have a time limit here. Colin Dansbury says, great presentation, Gleb. Could you expand on the top cognitive biases that impact mm -hmm. decision making? Confirmation bias, status quo bias, et cetera. Oh, I appreciate you that you know that, Colin. So confirmation bias causes us to look for information that confirm our beliefs and ignore information that doesn't. So for example, question number one in the technique, how do we, what information have you, haven't you fully, what important information haven't you yet fully considered helps us address the confirmation bias, especially by looking for information that goes against our beliefs, against what we already feel. So confirmation bias is definitely a big one that causes a lot of problems. The status quo bias is something that I talked about earlier, where entrepreneurs, small business owners get into a groove and they use their previous techniques for decision making on their previous ways that they were doing things to make decisions about the future. That's a problem. The status quo bias basically says that we tend to like where we are right now and we tend to dislike change. So we, our mental habits are informed by the past. We don't realize that the future will, is often going to be somewhat more disrupted than we anticipate. And so the status quo bias is a big one. Another one that I would highlight is the sunken cost fallacy. The sunken cost fallacy causes us to throw good money after bad. You've probably heard that expression, throwing good money after bad. Why does that happen? Well, we tend to get emotionally attached to a decision. When we get emotionally attached to a decision, we don't like to think that we're wrong. And making a change, stopping throwing good money after bad and then saying, no, I need to cut my losses involves admitting that we're wrong, that we made a bad decision and that we need to change our mind going forward. So now question number five in the five questions technique helps us address the sunken cost fallacy by saying, what information would cause me to revisit my decision? It helps you preempt that problem and the host of related problems. Thanks so much. Now, Rick Meyer said, I'm curious, how do you document these answers? Do you have a system with writing them down and then coming back later, you know, maybe to check on the quality mm -hmm. you know, once you've made the decision with this system? Yeah, so it depends on how you track your own information materials. I have a digital tracking system, meaning I take notes in a computer document and then I come back to it. Uh, one of the techniques that, I, that the book talks about, I haven't had time to talk about it in this presentation, it's called making predictions about the future. So you want to, as one of the things that you do as a business owner, always make a prediction on your decision. Say, hey, how likely am I to be right about this? 70%, 30%, 90%. And then see if you make a prediction that you're 70% correct, does it actually turn out in seven out of 10 cases that you're correct? 
maybe it turns out that you are correct only in four out of 10 cases. It means that you're pretty overconfident and you really need to decrease your confidence. So that is something that you definitely want to keep track of. And same thing with the five questions technique. You want to keep track of the five questions in a document and then come back to them. And then that's how you refine your ability to make better decisions over time by tracking and improving over time. Yeah, that's awesome. That feedback that really informs where you're actually at. That's awesome. So Kristen Ferry, uh, Ferry said, I like the five questions as a reminder to step outside of your gut and get an objective, full picture view of your decision. It's a nice reminder to take a moment to evaluate and not make a knee jerk reaction, or as I like to call it, and I'm with you here, ready, fire, aim. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, yes. This is part of the aim for orientation, aim and ready. You don't want, definitely want to do that before you fire. But of course it helps you make sure that when you fire, you don't get it wrong by saying things like, how have you addressed all the ways this could fail? Essentially the first three questions are the aiming part where you know what uh, information haven't you fully considered? What dangerous judgment errors haven't you taken to, well, have you not addressed here? What uh, would a trust and objective advisor tell you to do? So that's kind of about the for structure of the decision making itself. The other two questions are about implementation. How have you addressed the ways it could fail? And then what new information would cause you to revisit the decision? So it's kind of a pretty comprehensive approach. I think we have a final, final comment here from Bill Sheffer, who says, Dr. Sapersky, would you please talk to Eagles general manager, Howie Roseman, before the upcoming draft? <laughs> <laughs> Happy to, if you get me connected to him. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I thank you so much for your presentation today. You clearly created uh, some definite interest in our audience here. And we really appreciate it. And thank you so much for sending those free resources to those who requested. You're very welcome. And thank you very much for inviting me, Sue and Susan. Our pleasure as a chamber.